So I thought I would first start out just by telling you, you know, what you have to take constitutional law wise. I assume since you're here, you want to take more than what you just have to take. Um, but I thought I would tell you a little bit about our first year spring semester required constitutional law class. So everybody who comes takes one four credit course in the spring of your first year on constitutional law. And that course has two major parts to it. One part is what we call structure or powers, uh, which is about the structure of the Constitution, the kinds of things you think about from fifth grade civics, right? Uh, separation of powers, federalism, what can Congress do, what can it do? What powers are left to the states? What can the president do? Can the president detain people at Guantanamo Bay? Can the president not get detained? You know, what are the relationships between all the branches of the federal government? Um, so that's structure. And then the second half of the course are rights. Um, and for the most part, that part of the course has to do with individual rights under the 14th Amendment and particularly under the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause. The Due Process Clause, as many of you probably know, is where we have traditionally put such rights as reproductive rights uh, uh, and other rights of privacy and personal autonomy. Uh, the Equal Protection Clause is less about absolute rights that a person might have and more about comparative rights. Right? Do women and men have the same rights? Where do they differ? Do people across races have the same rights? How do we understand equality? How do we understand how the government treats people um, uh, across uh, classes of people and categories of people. There are um, uh, obviously individual rights and civil rights is one of the, uh, the big components of constitutional law and we have tons of civil rights related classes. In fact, one of the other concentrations, there are obviously lots of overlaps among these concentrations, but there's another concentration uh, that's called human rights uh, and civil liberties, I think, or something like that. Um, so there are courses like the one I teach called civil rights litigation, which is basically, as I teach it, a course on how to sue the government. Government. I think other people teach it as a course on how to defend against suits. But you could take either one. There are tons, I mean tons, I can't list them all. Um, you can look on the website if you want to, it's very user friendly. Um, there are tons of classes that have to do with race, with civil rights, with sex discrimination and gender, um, uh, uh, with national origins, immigration status, refugee status, uh, all, uh, that whole constellation of issues. Um, and then another direction, which is obviously related but slightly different, our First Amendment classes. Um, uh, my husband uh, is uh, also a law professor here and he's currently teaching a seminar on religion and the law. Um, there are uh, big classes and small classes on religion. There are First Amendment classes that focus on free speech uh, rather than on religion. There are so there's ideas of the First Amendment which is a more theoretical class and then there's more doctrinal classes, um, uh, First Amendment freedoms. Um, so the, the First Amendment, there's a very large First Amendment component if that's what your uh, interests are in. In addition, um, there are the historical courses. There's uh, constitutional history. We have two courses in constitutional history. One that goes from the founding through the end of the 19th century uh, and one that goes from the end of the 19th century to the present, essentially. I teach the latter one. Um, those are big survey courses that place constitutional law in larger historical context. And those are incredibly popular not mine, but, um, but th those are uh, incredibly popular classes and I, I think in part because they give you a different kind of window into constitutional law. They're not, they are about doctrine, but they're not just about doctrine and so um, uh, they enable you to, um, to, to branch out somewhat from, from the doctrine. Um, and then there are also classes that take off from the structural component of constitutional law. So we've got classes on presidential powers, we've got classes on the military and the law, uh, we've got classes on administrative law, which has a lot to do with um, uh, uh, cons constitutional powers and congressional powers. You know, I actually, when I look at this, I have trouble because I'm an imperialist, right? So I look at all the constitution and I think, environmental law, that's about the constitution. Tax law, that's about the constitution. We've got constitutional cases about all these things, right? And it's true that if you're looking for the constitution, you're going to find it in family law and you're going to find it in immigration law and you're going to find it in tax law and you're going to find it in environmental law and you're going you're to find it all over the place. Um, uh, but it is, um, 
uh, but that's not to say those classes are focused on those things, but you can think about them in constitutional context um, as well. And then the last thing I'll say, and this is also a plug for the kinds of stuff that I'm interested in, um, is we've got courses that deal with wealth inequality, with poverty, um, uh, with employment and work. Uh, so the class that I teach called Poverty in the Constitution basically asks the question, does the Constitution protect poor people? If it does, where? <laughs> if it does, how? What does it mean? There was a moment in the late 1960s when it seemed like the Warren Court might think that the Constitution protected poor people. And then that moment passed. So what does it mean that it, we had a moment and it passed? And when they tried to do it, they pulled constitutional theories out of everywhere, right? So some of them thought it was procedural due process. Some thought it was substantive due process. Some thought it was from equal protection law. Some thought it was from the preamble. I mean, wh where is it? So, um, so that class really uh, engages with the question of what the Constitution means. How do you go about doing constitutional interpretation? Um, and in terms of doing constitutional interpretation, there are also courses on jurisprudence and legal philosophy that would uh, tie in as well to sort of higher level theoretical questions about how you go about interpreting the Constitution, comparing originalism and interpretivism and textualism and, and thinking about how to, how to do that. Um, and then the final category I would say are courses that focus on the Supreme Court itself um, uh, as opposed to particular areas of doctrine that think about the court as an institution. We have lots of different kinds of courses which I'm sure is the same everywhere, right? But you've got the big lecture classes, which would happen, say, in here. Um, and then we have seminars, which have uh, are usually capped at 16 people, um, which happen in small rooms. They're usually discussions. You usually do a lot of writing in those. And then there are short courses, which are really wonderful because they enable us to pull faculty in from all over the country. So people come for two weeks at a time, and you have this intensive experience um, uh, talking about something quite particular. I highly recommend short courses. and both because they allow you to specialize and just because I don't know of any short course experience that people have not liked. I think, I think it's, it's really something that they love. Um, so in addition to the, the real, you know, the, the classroom academic course offerings, we have lots of clinics. Um, and the clinic that I think probably would be most interesting to many of you sitting in this room, um, because you chose to come here first thing in the day, is our Supreme Court Clinic. Um, our Supreme Court Clinic is pretty awesome. We just won our third case at the Supreme Court. We have had since the clinic started, the clinic maybe started three years ago, four years ago. I'm at that point in my life where I can't tell when time passes, so I could be wrong. Maybe it's five or six years ago, but it certainly started since I've been here. Um, so it's not more than eight years, and it definitely wasn't here my first couple of years. So, um, uh, But there have been four cases already up at the Supreme Court. We have won three of them. The fourth has yet to be decided. But they're very interesting. and. As students in the clinic, the first thing you do is help determine which cases to petition the Supreme Court to hear. So you go through cases coming out of the appeals courts um, and the state Supreme Courts, the federal appeals courts and the state Supreme Courts, and you bring them to the attention of the faculty and you say, I think this would be good, I think that. And then you interact with the lawyers who have been working on the cases to try to convince them that they want you to help them with their case, but maybe take it over. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and and then you know you work on the petition to the Supreme Court to see if they'll take the case, and then if they take the case, which we obviously have a pretty good track record, and five, let's say let's call it five years. In five years, uh, four cases taken is really pretty great. Um, and uh, and then you work on on the briefs, uh, and you work on preparing the lawyer uh, for who's going to do the oral argument, who's one of the clinical faculty members, um, to uh, to do the oral argument, and then you go to the court and you watch. I mean, it's really quite an opportunity, 